good morning and welcome to uh, the latest in our BDO financial reporting update. My name is Annie Taylor and I'll be joined today by my colleague Anthony Appleton and we work in BDO's technical financial reporting team. We expect today's webinar to last approximately 50 minutes and if you would like to ask a question during the webinar, please could you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Time permitting, we'll aim to answer your questions during the main body of the webinar, but uh, if not, then we will respond to you after the webinar. So if you do absolutely want a response to your question, please can you make sure you don't ask it anonymously, otherwise we won't be able to get back to you. So what is on the agenda for today's webinar? Moving on. We're going to start with the main feature of our financial reporting update for today, which is a UK GAP update on uh, the proposed amendments to FRS 102 uh, that were published back in December of this year. We'll then move on to an IFRS update and consider a couple of exposure drafts that may be of interest to preparers of accounts at the moment before moving on to our regular sustainability update, where we'll give you a recap on what's been happening in the sustainability space in the past quarter, before concluding with a roundup of other corporate reporting news. So I'll now pass on to my colleague, Anthony, who will cover the first two sections of today's webinar. Thank you, Annie. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, so I'll start by talking through the UK GAP uh, review. Just to remind ourselves, uh, this will be the second periodic review of um, FRS 102 and the other standards that, can, that, that, that make up UK GAP. Um, um, this review, as with the previous one, will uh, reflect on changes made to IFRS and developments within the UK just to try that where, where elements of the FRS 1 or 2, it, it was felt improvements could be made. But the primary focus really is looking at big new standards in IFRS and whether they should be incorporated into FRS 1 or 2. So moving on. Uh, um, so this is the second periodic review, so we will end up with the third edition of FRS 1 or 2. And the consultation on these changes is, is already underway, in fact, it's well underway, with FRED 82, Financial Report and Exposure Draft 82. Uh, that was published in December last year and is open for comments until the end of April. I'll come back at the end just to, uh, uh, to talk about the, uh, making your comments, but also whether you could share some comments with us to, uh, to um, help us shape our, our response to the FRC. Um, the major changes, the biggest changes relate to uh, um, um, revenue recognition and to the accounting for leases. And what the FRC have done is look to the IFRS 15, which is the international standard on revenue from contracts with customers, and IFRS 16 leases, and look to incorporate those principles into one or two. Now, there are simplifications. Uh, um, um, reflecting the scale and nature of those applying FRS 1 or 2 compared to international standards. But, but those simplifications are, are in reality quite limited. They deal with some of the real, uh, real pinch points in applying those two standards, but the main body of the principles will be, will be the same. Um, at the moment, they're proposing an effective date of for the final revisions um, of 1st January 2025, although we for one are recommending the delay that at least for those major changes related to revenue at least. Um, and this review has gone on um, alongside or rather just behind the ISB's review of the IFRS for uh, and, and As you know, the um, FRS 1 or 2 was based on IFRS for SMEs with changes made to reflect the nature of the UK uh, constituents. Uh, uh, um, and what the, IS, what the FRC have also done is looked at the proposals for changes to the IFRS for SMEs and considered whether any of them should be incorporated as well. Um, um, one point on that, there are some quite major differences between, between what the FRC are, are recommending for UK GAP and what the ISB said for IFRS for SMEs. 
primarily the ISB are not introducing IFRS 16 lease type principles into the IFRS for SMEs, at least not on this review. But they have introduced proposals to apply an expected credit loss model to financial instruments. Um, um, those of you with some IFRS knowledge will know of that in IFRS 9. Um, um, the FRC don't intend at this stage to bring in an expected loss, credit loss model, one of the models that look to look to the future for determining what loss to recognise on, on debtors, for example, or other financial assets. Um, although they have said they will consider it once to see where the IFRS for SME uh, um, um, lands. So let's look at some of the detail of those. Um, firstly, on revenue, so we may want the next slide. Um, um, so, yeah, proposed men looking at revenue from contracts with customers. So, so this slide partly contrasts it to IFRS 15 because some of you may be aware of it, but I will try and explain the core elements of it for those who don't. Uh, um, um, but if you if you know IFRS 15, the requirements are very similar, um, um, one or two simplifications. What they have tried to do, though, is express it more succinctly and in, a, and in, a, in a, a more easily digestible way. The most kind of obvious element of that is when we talk about IFRS 15, we're regularly talking about having a five-step model. Um, and, and I will explain what that is in, in a moment. But the standard isn't set out with five steps. It's only when you piece it all together, you realize it flaws in that way. Um, and the standard itself bounces around. What they have done in this section for the uh, FRS 102 is laid them out in chronological order, making it far more easy to follow. And um, what are their arguments for this? Well, partly it is about promoting efficiency in groups to minimize gap differences. You know, make it, if, if you've got an IFRS parent um, and both elements within the group apply IFRS 102, this will make it easier to, to consolidate. But also, they've always had a long-standing principle that that UK GAP should aim to reflect the most up-to-date thinking in, in areas of accounting, and clearly IFRS is, is a source for that. Um, um, to the five-step model, what, what this is is then a single comprehensive framework. What, what that really means is, you know, rather than at the moment, if you look at what's in revenue, uh, in the revenue uh, recognition section of FRS 102 today, there's a section on sale of goods. There's a section on the sale of services. There's a section on construction. What this does is say, no, everything should be accounted for in the same way, or we should be able to devise a model that covers all of these, these areas. And hence, this is the five step model. Uh, and, and, uh, what it will require you to do is to analyze revenue streams in, 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 in some more detail. Some elements of what you sell, you might find you have to recognize at a different point in time. Because what this is, it's a, it's a model based on control. When have you passed control of the uh, goods or services that you supply? When you've passed that control to the customer, rather than the current, when have risk and rewards been transferred? Generally, they will be the same time or a very similar time. In some cases, though, they can be different. So there will be a lot of having to consider your different revenue streams. Uh, um, also, the standard what requires you to identify the different things you promise. Um, um, IFRS 15 uses the word in that, in that box, separate performance obligations. Uh, um, what you'll find in FRS 1 or 2 is to simplify that slightly, that wording to talk about the promises, the promises you've made, the goods you've promised to supply, the maintenance you've promised to, to provide, the installation you've promised to give, for example. So what is this five-step model? I'm looking at the bottom. Firstly, identify the contract with the customer, know what it is we're talking about. Now, obviously, that, that uh, contract could be oral, written, in whatever form, but something that creates enforceable rights and obligations. You then look at that contract uh, and, and with your customer and say, well, what have I promised? What are the different things I've identified? And you do get an important word here. What are the distinct promises in, in the contract? Um, and just to bring that to life a little bit, if you think you, you uh, um, are building a house for someone, you will have set out the specification of electrics, plumbing, 
the brickwork, the insulation, the roof, etc. And in one way, that is a lot of different promises you've made. But the reality is they're not distinct. They're fully integrated into one significant promise, the house as a whole. And that distinguishes between, say, selling a good, which you then provide some, some additional maintenance contract or some additional after-sale service. They are separable because you could take any one of those in terms and they're not integrated in such a way that you have to provide all to the same customer. Then you look at the transaction price. So under the contract, what have you promised? To, what, what, what is your right to receive? Uh, um, and that will need you to think about both fixed elements, variable elements. That might the, the standard may constrain the amount of variable income you're allowed to consider to be part of the initial transaction price. And then you bring those two parts together. Allocate the overall transaction price for the contract to each of the distinct promises you've made. Once you've done that, you then know how much to recognize. But the final step is to determine when to recognize that. When you satisfy one of the promises you've made, the part of the transaction price you've allocated to that will be recognized as revenue. In many cases, this will be what you're doing without having thought about it in this way. You will be, in many cases, this is just a very reasonable and sensible way of, of, of of interpreting what's currently in the FS102. But because currently FS102 is somewhat vague, you may have taken a different route. You might find an alternate, a different uh, um, um, approach that isn't consistent with these five steps, and then you will need to make changes. Um, moving on to just a little bit of the detail, uh, and in the interest of time, I won't go through the, through all of this, but so move on to the next slide, please. Uh, um, just some, some matters of detail, uh, um, cost incurred in winning a contract, uh, um, um, especially in the kind of tender process, you have a, you will be able to um, um, capitalise that as a, a kind of policy choice. Um, what about if the if they can, the entity can put the uh, goods back to you? Well, um, um, in that case, this standard will take a probability-based approach, at least that's what the pros, and if it's probable the customer will, will send it back, well, then you shouldn't recognize the revenue, as opposed to IFRS 15, which, which actually has a higher before, um, and, and before you're not allowed to recognize revenue. Um, and some of the other little pieces, time value of money on the left-hand side there, this is um, something we're pushing back on. Um, and if you, if you, um, if you provide ex extended credit terms or drive for 15, you only need to worry about discounting that 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 uh, receivable if it's receivable in more than one year. I really don't know why, but the FRC have changed that to six months, and and and, and we will certainly be pushing back to say that that. that. Um, and if you're not going to follow the IFRS for SMEs, it should be because you're simplifying things and making it less burdensome. This actually makes it more burdensome. So I think it's completely inconsistent with our own principles for um, uh, aligning with our friends. Um, there will be, there are disclosure requirements, let's say it's less extensive, that means less extensive than IFRS 15, but certainly more than what you are currently used to. Uh, um, and if anywhere in your group there's an FRS 105 applier, well, they will apply a much more simplified model again. With that, I will move on to the next slide, please, and talk about the other big change, leasing. Um, those of you with some knowledge of IFRS 16 will, 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 hit, will know of this, but for those that, that, that don't, we're moving for lessees, so for tenants, for renters, into a, 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 a on balance sheet model. You need to clear, clear that, but accounting for a lessor where your landlord for property that won't be changing. This is only if you are the one renting the asset, the, the use of an asset. And what this is going to do is abolish the distinction in those cases between operating and finance lease. And instead, all leases are said to create a liability to pay all the amounts under that lease. But it also gives you an asset you can capitalize, which is the right to use it over the lease period. Um, um, so, so this is as so this is done in IFRS 16. There are some simplifications that that were mentioned, but but in any case, 
everyone will, re will, will, will need to think through all of the relationships they have on the use of assets and consider whether these are leases to be capitalised. There is and a couple of important exceptions to that capitalisation rule. I, ju I just, need to, just need to stress. Um, and if the lease is less than 12 months, you would just continue to show the rent as if it's an operating lease. If the lease is, if the lease is for a small value item, a computer, a laptop, a monitor, uh, and, um, um, and, and the standard includes a list of, of, of the kinds of things you're thinking of, then you, you can keep with the normal, with the current rental accounting. Um, we have proposed, we're, in, in our response, we're going to say we think it would be useful if you put a value on that, because that's what the ISB did when they introduced IFRS 16, a, 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 a monetary value, at least as a guide. Um, um, at the moment, they aren't proposing this for 105, um, and considering it to be too, com too, too complex for them. And it does lead to a rather strange situation, because if they were to include it, um, 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 some entities would if they recognise the asset, then they might breach the micro entity regime and thereby move into small and have to recognise it. Uh, uh, and actually, the same thing could happen, could happen for companies that are currently small. If, if they already breach one of the other tests, revenue or employees, this might bring more assets on the balance sheet to make them breach the gross asset rule and move out of small into uh, 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 and no longer being small. Um, moving on. Just to pick up on some of the detail, um, for those of you who have applied IFRS 16, one of the most difficult pieces is trying to find the discount rate to use. Um, um, the preferred option is to use the rate implicit in the lease, but that rate is a, a very difficult one to find and, and often impossible because it requires you to know about the um, 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 cost the lessors incurred. So it's not near impossible to, to apply. And, and so under IFRS 16, there's a backup of the incremental borrowing rate, um, and which again, once it's easier than the implied rate, does have some difficulties. And, and, and in development, this, this is one of the areas that people highlighted you know, would be most onerous. So the FRC have issued, uh, are, are allowed, are proposing two further options. A third option of the OBR, or obtainable borrowing rate, so how much, if you went to a bank today, how much could you borrow at, which the fear would be easier to, to determine. And then in exceptional circumstances, a backstop rate of, of, of publicly available uh, guild rate. I have to say, I don't, I, I personally don't support that at all because that really does not have any, um, 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 any references to, um, to the asset or indeed the entity. If someone's asked a question, are these changes very similar to US GAAP um, revenue and leases? And leases? Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, um, the revenue recognition uh, um, standard IFRS 15 was written with, in conjunction with the, uh, with the uh, US uh, um, FASB and similarly leasing was done. Um, there are some differences of detail between, between the IFRS and the US GAAP, but there are differences of detail the principles are the same, and this fits into that same um, 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 area of, 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 of applying the same principles. So, yeah, there is a rate across. Um, some other areas where they simplified the UK GAAP, um, fewer times the modifications will complicate the accounting, provided some extra practical expedience, uh, um, 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 including a simple account policy choice for certain. But again, I'm not going to go into detail, but I think they do show that, that idea that the principles are the same, the big picture is the same. Some of the areas of most complexity or difficulty in implementing IFRS 16, they've looked for ways to simplify. Moving on, please. They're the big differences then. Just a quick run through some of the other proposals. Um, <clears throat> Uh, section two will be updated to reflect the latest conceptual framework developed by the ISB. Um, and someone's also asked, what will the OBR be based on? Well, it, it's the bank rate you can obtain at point in time. So to rate that, if you, so, so if you went to the bank, would you be able to uh, um, 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 get the, um, um, what, what rate would they, they offer you? Um, and so that could simply be determined by asking the question. 
and so it's the more of Q&A coming through. Um, so the first year end, oh, Moz uh, is helping me there, but I'll quickly say, if they stick with their proposal of years commencing 1st of Jan 2025, then, then the, fir the first year end will be December 2025. So June year end will be June 26. As I said, we are, we are going to respond and say, uh, we think the revenue and leases should be delayed by a year. Okay, keep on moving on. Um, fair value measurement, aligning, sorry. So could just go back one slide. Um, um, fair value measurement, um, aligning the fair value definition with IFRS 13 will make a difference in your fair value and liabilities. Um, um, and then in terms of small entities, if you've got any small companies in your group, um, whereas at the moment certain disclosures could only be encouraged because of limitations in law, following Brexit, those limitations have gone. And so those same handful of uh, disclosures are now going to be required disclosures. Um, if you've got any Irish subsidiaries, that bit can't apply to them because obviously Ireland didn't exit the EU and uh, legal restrictions would remain. Moving on. Um, and here we see some other differences. Uh, um, um, yeah, um, a positive step and ground concern will be required. Uh, if you've never taken, if you've taken the option of buy IS39 in the past, you can keep it. But going forward, you won't be able to adopt IS39. The option will be removed. Um, for business combinations, um, and more guidance on distinguishing between an amount paid is to buy the business, or the amount paid is to keep the former shareholders on as employees, and thereby it's actually remuneration. Um, so not as if you've ever met that problem in IFRS three. IFRS three is very strict on that on this. Uh, and this is more um, um, a principle or substance based uh, decision. Um, there'll be further disclosure on business combinations. They've clarified the measurement of cash settled share based payments and new disclosures when there are uncertain tax um, and positions, um, and uncertain tax rules. So, if there's something which where you are not sure if the HMRC will agree, well, then you have to provide some disclosures. Moving on. Please. And on to the next steps. Um, um, the consultation continues until the 30th of April 2023. So if you've got any comments, please do get them into FRC. Um, um, we would expect to see a standard by the end of this year. And they've said it will be not less than 12 months to implement. And then, as I said, at the moment, the effective date is years commencing 1st of January 2025. Um, we are putting in a response, so on to the next slide, please. Um, um, and we have, some of you may have already received this. We've sent out a very quick, easy to complete survey, basically just to help us gather a few thoughts from preparers, particularly around the FIC's question on the costs of the impact, their impact assessment, and thereby the cost of implementation. We think they might have understated that. Um, 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 but we don't have the evidence ourselves. We don't. We don't do. We aren't preparers. So, so if you were to um, and respond to that, it would certainly help us provide a more influential response to the FRC. Um, um, if you haven't already received a, a request to complete that, what, uh, when we send out to you after this webinar our, our materials, we will send you a link at that time. Right. Next bit for me. I press update. Um, um, and moving straight on into that, um, onto the next slide, please. Um, first thing, an ISB emission exposure draft for IS12. Um, um, this is really only an issue if you are a large group, very large group of 750 million uh, um, revenue, and you're operating multinational. With that in mind, I won't go through all the details here, but just just a just a heads up on it. Um, um, uh, the OECD agreed. Uh, uh, the OECD countries agreed uh, uh, made an agreement um, around to avoid tax evasion by moving uh, profits to low tax countries. And 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 what this really requires is for such companies will end up having to pay at least fifteen percent on their income in every country. Um, this is going to be introduced piecemeal by different jurisdictions around the world at different rates. 
we are expecting some to, to to do it soon in the far east but you know the process for european countries and the uk it's not yet clear given all of that uncertainty of when it will apply given the uncertainty of how it will apply because jurisdictions will, will have their own uh, models for implementing that agreement deferred tax calculated deferred tax would be an absolute nightmare so on to the next slide that is what the isb oops sorry no wasn't the next slide because in the back of this is on that, that one um, um so we've just got back one slide um um in the in the third box there um the isb have proposed amendments which will basically say for the purpose of deferred tax for the purpose of applying is 12 these these um and any impact of OECD pillar two can be ignored um, and you just need to make some minor disclosures to allow people to understand whether it will impact in the future. Uh, we have supported it because um, and we certainly do think the complexity would be almost impossible to overcome. Um, on the next slide please. Um, um, the next proposed amendments is into IFRS 9. Um, I'm trying to deal with two issues. One the BACS payment question, electronic payment systems, which we may have, I think we've touched on in the past, and also uh, financial uh, instruments that are linked to ESG performance. Because sometimes you get loan agree green loans where you will pay a lower interest if you meet certain ESG targets. Um, and in response to that, they are they are they are proposing some amendments as well as some amendments for on disclosures. Uh, um, and we move on to the next slide. I will touch on the first of those. Uh, um, so the question here was, if you make a payment or receive money by backs, when do you recognize the cash and when do you de-recognize the trade asset, the, the trade debtor or trade creditor? Um, and is it when the button is pressed and the backs payment be process begins, or is it when it actually lands in the recipient's account? Um, 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 uh, question went to IFRI. IFRI concluded it should be when cash landed. Many people responded, but that's not what we're doing. So this is a hugely disruptive thing to do via IFRI. So the ISB agreed to do it to look at it via them. And what they are like, what they are proposing is that you only recognise, you only change your debtors or creditors when the cash lands, in other words, when it settles or the settlement debt, except that if you are, are using electronic payment for a liability, you can de-recognize the liability before settlement, but only if you have no ability to withdraw, stop or cancel the payment, the bottom left box, uh, you have no practical ability to access the cash in the meantime, so it's appropriate to de-recognize the cash and, and, and any risk of the system failing to complete the transaction is insignificant. Um, what will that mean for a back system? Well, when you press the button, you still have a period of time when you can cancel the back payment. It is only due at a point in time during that waiting process where you can no longer cancel that you would be able to de-recognize the liability. But notice this is only on the liability side uh, and, and, and you wouldn't recognize cash received at all until it hits your bank account. So this will this will create some um, um, system changes for many, many entities. And then finally for me, the other part of those amendments on the next slide uh, um, um, is, is around loans that are linked to ESG um, factors. Um, um, they're going they're clarifying the way the um uh, clarifying what is a basic lending arrangement and clarifying that that it can still be a basic lending arrangement <clears throat> there are contingent events if those events meet those bullet points in the middle box and and and, and really what this is saying is things like esg about your own esg performance is that that is a change, any change in the contractual cash flow, the interest you paid, um, 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 is based on an event that's specific to you. It's entirely specific to you how well you perform in ESG. And the thing that you meet these three, three conditions, then you can continue to treat that at amortized cost rather than the fear that such loans would then be fair value through P and L. Anyway, canter through. 
uh, quite a pace, but I've still used quite a lot of Manny's time. Apologies for that. And I will pass over to Annie now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anthony. OK, so I'm going to pick up on um, our regular sustainability update. So if we move on to the first slide. So first of all, um, we just wanted to draw your attention to a publication from the FRC um, that was released in January of this year. And this includes an update um, on their ongoing monitoring of climate related financial disclosures. So as you know, it first came man it first became mandatory for entities with a premium listing on the uh, main market of the London Stock Exchange to provide disclosures consistent with uh, TCFD for periods beginning on or after 1 January 2021 and subsequently it then became mandatory for December 22 year ends for standard listing listed entities to provide these disclosures. So the purpose of this bulletin was really to give um, a bit of a heads up to those standard listed entities about experiences of the FRC in terms of what those premium listed entities had produced um, for December 21 year ends and to give them an insight into what would be expected of them um, for the first time preparing these disclosures. So the market bulletin picks up on reporting gaps, reminders and next steps proposed by the FCA. Um, I thought it might be useful here to give you an insight into some of my own observations. Um, part of my role involves reviewing financial statements of listed entities. So I've had experience of reviewing premium listed entities disclosures, as well as um, being involved in the process of assisting standard listed entities with preparing these disclosures for the first time this year. And what I would say is that it doesn't come without its challenging challenges. I think there's a couple of things, um, a couple of key themes that I would highlight. I think the first is that providing these disclosures is not intended to be a tick box exercise. I think entities that approach it with the right mindset tend to find it easier to provide the disclosures. So what do I mean by this? Well, the FCA has um, is requiring these entities to provide these disclosures because ultimately it's aware of climate change is going to affect all listed entities and these effects can be extremely complex. And hence, it's very important that investors have an understanding of how that entity is managing those risks and opportunities um, related to the risk of climate change. And so um, the point of TCFD is for um, these entities to provide a structured and transparent disclosures to allow those investors to make informed decisions, to maintain the integrity of, um, of the capital markets and to ensure that asset prices are, assets are priced correctly. So what I found is that entities that take that approach of the starting point is make sure that you have robust systems in place for managing those risks and opportunities and then explain those the disclosure seems to flow more naturally rather than those entities that perhaps try to shoehorn um, the attempts that they've made into fitting fitting into that disclosure structure another thing is that the compliance statement is key and compliance statements need to be honest, factual and transparent. So TCFD um, as required, reporting as required by the listing rules is on a comply or explain basis. So it's not expected that entities will be able to comply with every single one of uh, the 11 required of the 11 disclosure recommendations at this point. What is important is that entities explain the point at which they sit currently on the journey and what steps they intend to take to get to a position where they can provide full compliance. And then another thing is, I think what is meant by compl compliance is also a bit nuanced. It's not black and white and it's difficult to understand. Some key things that I've taken away from my experience is that the FCA expects, and it's an explicit requirement of the listing rules to refer to the TCFD annex. So to the guidance for all sectors and then the supplemental guidance for financial and non-financial groups. And for 20, 
2022 year ends, it's now an explicit requirement to refer to the um, TCFD's guidance on metrics, targets and transition plans. This guidance is helpful. It provides a very detailed and comprehensive structure in order for entities to provide granular and detailed disclosure and to provide what the FCA are looking for. So just coming back to the primary market bulletin, a couple of emerging themes that are coming up um, that are on the FCA's radar. The first is that they want to see improved connectivity between the front half of the financial statements and the back end when it comes to climate related disclosures. So for example, say in an a, a entity within the energy sector, an oil and gas entity that has expressed narrative in their front end disclosure regarding um, their expectations about how the future market in terms of the consumer demand for fossil fuels will reduce. We would expect to see disclosures in the back end as to how that's incorporated into the impairment reviews, into the assumption, the inputs into determining the recoverable amount of mining property assets. That's something they're going to be looking for more closely going forward. Also, transition plans is a key area of focus for them going forward. And finally, um, they've expressed an appetite to build on the current disclosure rules in line with domestic and international developments. So, for example, when the ISSB statement uh, standards are finalised, we expect those to be incorporated into, within the FCA's listing rules. Uh, they will continue to monitor listed companies' climate-related financial disclosures. It's an iterative process and it's not going away, and we. Um, but if entities take it in the spirit it's intended, by the starting point being ensuring that their processes and procedures are robust and it's embedded in their governance structures, then the, the, it will become easier because simply the requirement is to explain what you are doing, where you are up to, and what you need to do to get to a position where you can provide further information. So moving on to the next slide. So moving on to the expansion of the scope of TCFD aligned reporting in the UK, we just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that um, for periods beginning on or after 6th of April 2022, so this will be effective for the first time for April 23 year end, so it's coming up soon, there will be a requirement that has been brought into company law for certain entities to mandatorily provide climate related financial disclosures that are aligned with TCFD. So which entities does this affect? It's entities that would normally be required under company law to provide a non-financial statement, which uh, consists of public interest entities. So that would be your traded entities, banks and insurance companies with more than 500 employees, AIM companies uh, with more than 500 employees and private companies and LLPs that have 500, over 500 million pounds of turnover and over 500 employees. So the non-financial information statement that's included within the strategic report will be renamed to be the non-financial and sustainability statement. And within that statement, entities will need to include these mandatory climate related financial disclosures in order to comply with UK company law. The requirements are based on TCFD. They're not exactly the same. Um, it, the uh, UK legislation has had to use slightly different wording to uh, fit in with the requirements for uh, the UK legislative framework. The best place to look if you think you might be coming in scope and want to get a head start on getting the information required to produce these disclosures is in um, a Bayes non-binding Q&A guidance that they have published, which is available at the link on screen. So moving on. We also wanted to draw your attention to what is a, an excellent and very comprehensive publication that BDO Global have produced, the link uh, of which, to which is available on screen, which provides a, an update of all of the developments that took place within the sustainability space within 2022 and 
what to expect in 2023. So for example, it covers the uh, exposure drafts that were released by the ISSB proposing two climate related financial disclosures standards. And it also um, considers what actions the ISB took in, in terms of responses they received to their consultation. And it covers how the ISB has incorporated stakeholders' concerns and how they intend to reflect those in the final standards once they are released. The publication also covers, um, from an EU perspective, the new Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and the first batch of the European Sustainability Reporting Standards that were uh, released in December of last year that we mentioned in the December webinar. The key thing to consider here is that the requirements are extremely detailed and comprehensive, but also the scope is very broad. So one thing to watch out for is um, for example, even if you don't have an EU entity, so an entity incorporated in the EU uh, in your group, or if you uh, don't have an EU listed entity in your group, then you could still be within the scope of, the, of this directive and these uh, standards, because um, there is a requirement that if a group generates over 150 million turnover in uh, euros turnover, than in the EU, then a um, and has a subsidiary, which or a branch that meets certain criteria, then you could be in scope. The requirements kick in for the first time for periods beginning on or after first of January twenty twenty four on a phased basis. The best place to look if you do think you might be uh, captured by the scope of these requirements is within this publication, which provides some further details on this. So it's really just um, something that you might need to be aware of um, going forward. The US Securities and Exchange Commissions uh, also continue to make progress on their consultation for mandatory climate related disclosures uh, to be included in registration statements and period reporting. So when do we expect these things to be finalized? From the ISSB's perspective, the final versions of IFRS S1 and S2 are expected to be issued in the first half of this year. So all being well, we would hope to have an update for you on that in our June webinar. The US SEC are also expected to finalize their standards in 2023, at which point entities will be able to begin to compare the requirements of the uh, US SEC and the IASB, ISSB standards with the ESRSs. So moving on to the next slide. The IFRS Sustainability Symposium took place in on the 17th of April 2023. And the key takeaways from this symposium are on screen, but I think the key thing to take away from this is that it appears to be the case that there is an appetite globally and a commitment globally for the development of this global baseline for climate related uh, financial disclosures. And many stakeholders have assisted in the process um, by which the ISSB has made um, made the progress towards finalising these standards and they have taken into consideration all of the feedback that they've received which is potentially why there's been a slight delay to the standards ultimately being finalised. However we do expect this shortly. Okay so moving on to the next slide please, thank you. Uh, a final quick recap of another of couple another couple of useful publications that BDO Global have published, which are available from the links um, that are included in the slide. The first is on the greenhouse gas protocol, which is a fundamental requirement in sustainability reporting frameworks. This publication provides a very comprehensive, useful, and practical summary 
on measuring greenhouse gas emissions and includes a number of worked examples. So as you come to report under these various different um, frameworks within which you are in scope, it provides a really useful practical guide to doing this. Finally, um, there is a publication on the first of the European Sustainability Reporting Standards that I mentioned, and this one covers the uh, first of these standards, uh, which uh, requires entities to explain how climate risk affects th their governance strategy, business model metrics and charges. It provides a concise and clear seven page summary of what is currently included in that draft legislation, uh, which is expected to be finalized shortly. So moving on. We're going to conclude today's webinar with a roundup of other corporate reporting news. So if we start off with the first news item, this one is on forthcoming changes for small companies, and we just wanted to make you aware of uh, certain government plans for new and amended legislation, which is relevant to corporate reporting for small companies. The first relates to the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill. So this was published back in, I think it was October of last year. It's currently not being finalised, it's going through due process and I think it's sitting for one of its readings in the House of Lords at the moment. It includes a plethora of different changes uh, to legislation in respect of small companies, but the ones we wanted to highlight today were in respect of the corporate reporting requirements. So. The key proposals include, firstly, for micro entities and small companies, there is proposed to be a requirement to file profit and loss accounts, and for small companies only, a director's report at company's house. It's also proposed that um, the option to prepare abridged accounts for such entities will be removed, and where entities take an audit exemption, they will need to uh, provide an additional statement explaining the fact that they are taking that exemption and detailing how they qualify for it. If you're concerned that some of these changes may affect your entity, then there are a series of government fact sheets available uh, which summarise these corporate reporting changes as well as the more broader changes uh, to small companies. The link to the fact sheet is available on the slide pack that you'll receive after the webinar. Finally, um, so some further legislation was proposed to increase the small company size threshold. So I'll explain how this works, but basically it was announced by the government back in October that the definition of small businesses would be extended to include those with up to 500 employees. So currently uh, under company law, there are certain thres thresholds specified by which an entity can qualify as being small, being a turnover threshold, an asset threshold and an employee threshold. And uh, currently the employee threshold sits um, at 50 employees and they're proposing to extend that to 500 employees. There's also an intention to consult on increasing this threshold to a thousand employees in the future. As I said, uh, there's no intention to change the turnover or asset threshold. So where does that leave you now? Well, there has been no amendment to the existing definition in the Companies Act. So if you currently meet the definition of being small under the Companies Act, that has not changed. What the government have said is that if they should issue new legislation, then, and if that legislation refers to small entities, it will be this new revised definition with the higher employee threshold that will, will effectively be what is meant by small in that legislation. So no changes have currently been made. Any changes would likely be made during this year, and we will advise and continue to update you if anything concrete happens within this space. So moving on to the next news item. 
The FCA also issued another primary market bulletin um, earlier this year, which is in respect of digital financial reporting. So as a reminder, this became um, mandatory for certain companies um, with trans transferable securities on UK regulated markets. And it's been a requirement since 1st of January 2021. Um, entities within scope need to submit tagged financial reports electronically onto the FCA system, and this is a mandatory requirement. Um, it's a really useful article. Um, we've included the link on the slide pack that you will receive, um, a link to the FCA website where this is discussed. The market bulletin discusses um, the step-by-step -step process you need to go through in order to, to um, to carry out this process of submitting these um, accounts electronically. It, um, it details the fact that the quality of what the FCA have been receiving has not always been up to scratch. Um, and it also details the fact that the FCA system has been updated for new taxonomies. So moving on. So um, in our final news item, this is another new listing rule requirements that we've mentioned a couple of times previously. However, it's now uh, becoming effective for the first time. So it was effective for periods beginning on or after 1st of April 2022. So will be effective for the first time for March 23 year ends. So the listing rule requirement is a requirement to report information on the representation of women and ethnic minorities on boards and within senior management. So I've included a link to the FCA market bulletin that describes this rule further and gives additional information on screen. The reporting is on a comply or explain basis. It applies to UK and overseas issuers with premium or standard share listings uh, with some exceptions. And it requires entities amongst other things. So I'm not explaining in detail everything that's required by this today, but broadly speaking, Entities in scope will need to provide a statement in their annual report, setting out if companies have met specific board diversity targets. The key thing to take from this market bulletin is that the FCA have set out in, in the article their intention to ensure that, that their rules are enforced and the entities who don't comply and don't explain why they're not comply. Uh, sorry, if they don't comply and then don't explain a reasonable basis for why they're not complying, the FCA has um, explained that they intend to take this very seriously and will deliver sanctions within the remit of their powers if uh, these disclosure requirements aren't uh, provided appropriately. So that is the final part of today's financial reporting update. And um, thank you very much for your attendance. And I think, as far as I'm aware, I don't think there's any uh, existing questions that need to be answered. I've just, sorry, I've just seen, um, I've just got one question on whether the board diversity is applicable for an AIM listing. This is uh, not the case. It's applicable for um, entities listed on the main market. Otherwise, I think, there is um, no further questions. So I'd like to thank you all for your attendance and we will uh, send you a link to the slide pack um, and a recording subsequent to the webinar. And we will see you again in June for the next in our regular quarterly financial reporting updates. Thank you very much and goodbye.